Neoliberalism is a way of defining human beings by the market, um, as if everything we do is mediated through the market, not just in the economic sphere, but in every aspect of our lives, that um, human uh, life is defined by competition, um, and we are defined as if we are simply trying to maximise our own wealth and power at the expense of everything else. That's the description of humanity at the heart of neoliberalism, which then seeks to extend that idea um, by attacking trade unions, which stand in the way of what they consider to be the free functioning of, of the market, by ripping down regulations, by ripping down taxes, particularly for rich people, by tearing up anything which stands in the way of this magical thing called the market, which actually turns out to be not that abstract entity they like to talk about as if it were some force of nature, but an entity which is controlled by people, often very rich people, very powerful people. And so getting everything out of the way of the market is getting everything out of the way of those rich and powerful people. And while it began as a sincere philosophy, it very quickly became a self-serving racket, uh, which effectively exempted billionaires and large corporations from the constraints of democracy, from paying their taxes, from not polluting, from having to pay fair wages, uh, from not exploiting their workers. Um, all, all of those things could be torn down under the justifications that neoliberalism produced. One of the things that neoliberalism wants to get out of the way is democracy. Um, it, it, in, in some respects, it's been absolutely overt about that. Fr um, Frederick Hayek, in the Constitution of Liberty, um, saw democracy as an impediment to the freedom of the very rich, which he felt was the absolute value that needed to be protected. Um, and so in a competition between those two things, it was democracy that had to go. When he visited um, Ch Chile under Pinochet, um, he said he would rather live in an economically liberal dictatorship than in a democracy without economic liberalism. Um, and, and so they, they were pretty clear about this agenda um, and they have set out basically to um, take the power out of democracy. One of the ways they've done so is to shift power out of democratic forums like parliaments into bodies that we can't control be it the International Monetary Fund or the European Central Bank or offshore trade tribunals um, where power has, has moved away from us. It's no longer subject to democratic constraints. Neoliberalism has provided the ideological framework that justifies the sweeping away of the power of people and its replacement with the power of money and the power of corporations, which is an organised form that money takes. Um, and it's been extremely successful in, in, in this respect, um, leading to the mass deregulation of those corporations, um, including the deregulation of mergers and acquisitions, allowing them to form a new wave of monopolies, banks too big to fail, corporations too big to fail, privatised public services too big to fail, all of which end up getting bailed out by the state, uh, because um, they simply can't function in the real world because they are not sufficiently subject to the constraints that people would, would, would wish to impose on them. And they um, tend necessarily towards crisis uh, without that state intervention. So there's a profound irony here in that neoliberalism was supposed to get the state out of the way, but it requires intense state involvement in order to function. Globalisation is, is something which was promoted quite deliberately in some respects by neoliberal thinkers. Um, it, one, one respect in which they did it was to pull down capital controls, the other was to destroy the fixed exchange rate system, um, the other of course has been the mass outsourcing of, of business, the creation of transnational corporations on a very large scale um, with unaccountable subsidiaries um, that um, can't be held to account for what other parts of the corporate network do. All of that has made it very difficult for governments and people to get a grip on corporate power and to restrain it, which of course is part of the point. Now I believe there's some quite positive aspects of globalisation. The main problem with it 
is that the tremendous power that goes with it is not subject to democratic constraint. There is no global democracy. There is, there is no democratic globalization. Um, and, and without that democratic constraint, it becomes the place, the non-place, where power resides, having fled from democratic national forums. This process leads us um, weak, atomized, um, incapable of uh, engaging with the scale of the problems that, that, that afflict us. The state says it's going to get out of our lives and get out of the way, but the state is the only actor which is big enough to constrain the power of billionaires and corporations. We can't do it by ourselves. And so what the state is effectively doing is siding with them in allowing them to escape from the constraints of democracy. And what that means is that we then become incapable of addressing our own problems because they are so much bigger than we are and we've got no um, agent through which we can act to, um, to, to constrain those powers. And, um, and, and so we have this weird phenomenon of the self-hating state, of the state which says our role is to destroy ourselves, our, our role is to get out of the way on behalf of our political funders and the newspaper magnates and the other promoters of neoliberalism who benefit so much from it. One of the crucial aspects of neoliberalism is to tear down the regulations that protect the living world from exploitation because those regulations make it harder for people like the Koch brothers or ExxonMobil or other destructive corporations to make loads of money by extracting resources and by dumping their pollution. When they have to pay for the pollution they cause and pay to stop um, creating that pollution, when they have to pay fair prices for the resources they extract, um, when they have to um, respect local communities who might be destroyed by open cast mining or oil spills, then their profits disappear. So a great deal of the thrust of this has been to get those regulations off their backs, those regulations that for us are protections, it's what defends us against exploitation and destruction, and to be able to do whatever the hell they want to the living world and to other people, to dump their costs on the rest of us. And so while the environmental crisis predated neoliberalism, it has been greatly accelerated by neoliberalism, by, 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 by this escape from the constraints of democracy. There's an issue which almost nobody writes about or talks about, and yet it's perhaps more fundamental than any other issue at all, which is soil. Soil is the basis of human civilization. Soil is a basis of human existence. We do not exist without soil. Everything we eat, everything which contributes to our body mass comes from soil. According to the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, we have 60 years of harvest left at current rates of soil loss and degradation. Um, and yeah, this is a marginal issue. It doesn't feature in politics, doesn't feature in debate. It's not on the news. No one's talking about this, yet it is the most fundamental issue of all. It's an illustration of the fact that what's salient is not what's important, and what's important is not what is salient. The, the, the news media have a profound bias in all sorts of ways, but the biggest bias of all is the bias against relevance. Those things which are objectively most relevant to our lives are marginalised, while total trivia is put in their space um, put, put front and centre as the things we ought to obsess about. Neither Trump nor Brexit could be plainly described as neoliberal. Trump is too incoherent really to be clearly described as anything. Um, but both of them are in some ways a result of neoliberalism because what neoliberalism has done is to destroy effective political choice. It's been to destroy democratic power. And so, from the perspective of most people, politics is then reduced to a meaningless yabber taking place above their heads. It's, it, it's of no relevance. And political debate becomes pointless. All people hear with political debate is one self-serving elite talking to another self-serving elite and none of it making any sense to the rest of us. And when you get that situation, when politics has effectively been drained of relevance to our lives, then you get a reactive anti-politics 
taking its place. And anti-politics, which incidentally is um, fermented with the help of atomization. When communities are broken, when society is broken, when we don't um, anymore enjoy the sense of common purpose, then it's much more likely that um, a, a demagogic extremist anti-politics will fill that gap. And of course, that is another product of neoliberalism, that atomization of society. And so those things combined have led people to look for an alternative to politics. And instead of um, uh, seeking to solve issues through political argument and debate, looking for slogans, for symbols, for sensations instead. That's what Trump offered. That's what the Leave campaign offered. It didn't offer coherent political arguments that this is how we're going to improve your life. It, it, it could make you feel good about kicking over the system and starting again. And so one of the great ironies is that in response to um, the destruction of political choice and political power by neoliberalism, we've ended up with, in America, the kind of person that Frederick Hayek, the father of neoliberalism, worshipped. This um, ultra-rich person who'd inherited his wealth, who can do what the hell he likes and blaze a trail, however crazy, that other people can, can follow because he's completely uninhibited by the constraints of democracy. That is Donald Trump. And so the reaction to neoliberalism, to what neoliberalism has done to our politics, has ended up empowering the great um, Randian, Hayekian, neoliberal hero. There's no question that immigration is going to remain a huge live issue for a very long time, not least because very large numbers of people are going to be driven to immigrate or, or to, to migrate away from their own countries and to try to enter other countries through the massive disruptions taking place to their lives, through, through war, through climate change, through economic dislocation. Um, in many parts of the world, there will simply be nothing there for people. There will be nothing to hold them anymore because there is no economic basis anymore, no social basis anymore, no environmental basis anymore. It seems to me, though this is by no means a complete solution, that robust, self-confident, self-reliant communities are far more likely to be able to welcome immigrants into the community than places where people are completely atomized, thrown into destructive competition with each other, fearful and insecure. And so it, it, it's only going to be part of the solution, but one thing we need to do for a whole load of reasons, and immigration is one of those reasons, but by no means the only one, is to try to rebuild community, is to try to rebuild local geographic communities, with local economies, with um, a, a local sense of social solidarity, political power vested to some extent in that community. And from those grassroots, we can then start to rebuild a national and a global politics. We've been seeing now for many years a great tearing down of environmental protections, of the protections of our future, the protections of the whole of the rest of the living world. And this is only going to get worse under Trump and under Brexit. That, that's absolutely clear. Whether the Paris Agreement on climate change will survive in any recognisable form, well, that's a big question. I mean, already it's being honoured in the breach with governments setting climate change programmes which bear no relation to the pledges that they made at Paris um, and setting us on course for three, four, five degrees of global warming. Um, so nothing like what the Paris Agreement foresaw. Um, and it's hard to see that getting anything other than worse at the moment, in the short term, with the disastrous political decisions that are being made on both sides of the Atlantic and elsewhere in the world. It's as if um, the natural world can just be used as a dumping ground for all our political crises. Um, you, companies want to make more profit, well, tear down the protections so they can rip into the natural world further. Um, people want jobs, tear down the protections, so in the very short term they can have some jobs even if it leads to no one having a job in the future. Um, it, it's an easy political choice to make because the natural world has no voice and those who try to speak in defence of the natural world, we are marginalised by this huge lobbying effort 
loads of money poured in by billionaires, poured in by corporations to deny climate change, to deny other environmental issues, to um, cast those who try to protect the living world as enemies of the people. And it's been extremely successful with these great echo chambers that have been created online to just promote and promote this idea that there isn't an environmental problem and anyone who says there is is a communist trying to take your money away. I can't write about an issue without looking for a solution to that issue. And having documented so many of the problems in um, this book, the book I'm working on now is called Out of the Wreckage, and it's looking for ways in which we can start to climb out of this multi-headed mess that we've got ourselves into. And it seems to me that what's fundamental to that is we need a new political story. It's amazing how we have completely failed, within mainstream politics at any rate, to develop one. Mainstream politics, on the left and centre, the last political story was John Maynard Keynes's general theory, published 80 years ago. Outside of mainstream politics, there's thousands of new stories, which is part of the problem. There's a cacophony. No one can hear any of them because everyone's shouting, saying, I've got the answer, I've got the answer, and so it all just becomes unintelligible. What I'm trying to do is to pull out the best of those solutions which have been devised by other people, sifting through hundreds and hundreds, some of which are total rubbish, some of which are pretty good, some of which are brilliant. Finding the best ones and trying to weave those into a coherent new political narrative. It's not going to be something I do by myself, this is going to be a collective effort, but what, what I'm trying to do with that book is to promote that process and get us a little bit further along the road of writing that new story.